uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome again to the commentary uh, speaking. As we were reminded in the gym to keep our phones on silent and not to record because the video is going to be shared with all of us. I welcome Gwen Mukim, who's our first speaker. Picture this situation. While you are deep asleep in your cozy bed, the, a news report about a, the traffic accident pops up on your smartphone. Your smartphone alarm wakes, up, wakes you up the earlier than its set time, and simultaneously, the lights turn on. Um, when you, as you wake up, you go, to a you go to the shower room, but before you take a shower, the boiler turns on automatically. And to, to, ensure, to ensure you to have a hot, immediate hot water. After you take after your shower, you go to the kitchen to you go to the kitchen to eat your breakfast. And that breakfast pops out from the toaster. When you leave your house, the, the, all of the electronic devices are shifted to the sleep mode automatically. And these kinds of conveniences seem futuristic, but these are, they are actually happening right now. This is due to a breakthrough, breakthrough of technology called the Internet of Things, or IoT. The Internet of Things is an interconnection of devices Im embedded in everyday devices. It operates through special measures by allowing objects to be remotely controlled across the infrastructures. By connecting those infrastructures, the IoT allows an endless connection between machines. Think about it this way. When you visit a sky tree, to see Tokyo's land, to, to see the, the landscape of Tokyo, you don't know the exact information about that place. However, if IoT integrates with the computer in the telescope, you are able to know the information about those places where you are looking at, and also the specific places. Well, this is the technology of IoT, where the object itself utilizes the information. Essentially, the connectivity between electron, uh, IoT offers the connectivity between machine electronic products and machines. This is called a machine-to-machine -machine process. A machine-to-machine -machine process is a direct communication between products and machines, such as computers, smartphones, and televisions. This inc also includes wire and wireless connections. The interconnection of devices is applicable in many fields. And this allows advanced applications. These advanced applications enhance our daily life experiences. Let's take an example of smart cars. Smart cars function through the, connect the wireless connections between those machines. Well, also, it also detects those detects the places the, the information of the places where you want to go by the wireless connections between the cars and the GPS and the signals received by those by the other cars. While the IoT offers so many positive effects due to its conveniences and smartness. It also exposes humanity risks, as it is case with many things in our lives. Greater return accompanies with greater risks. Have you ever heard of the technological singularity? Well, uh, well by the advent of IoT, technological but many experts are predicting that technological singularity is approaching soon. 
For those who may not know what this means, think of the movie series The Matrix, where the technological advancement skyrocketed to, a humans, uh, to an extent of humans can control over the machines, uh, but actually become hostages of them. Luckily enough, even without Neo, by, pre by careful and proper preparations, people can, humankind can overcome this danger and remain as a top predator in the food chain. Stay tuned in on what's coming with the technolo technological advancement is definitely be helpful due to its technology because the technological breakthroughs intertwine our lives and it is key to our near future. Klaus Schwab, the world the founder of World Econ World Economic Forum said, I believe that if managed well, the fourth industrial revolution can bring a new cultural renaissance which will make us feel part of something much larger than ourselves, a true global civilization. In order to do that, we are develop developing how our sh shared view of technology, such as Internet of Things, influences our lives. Thank you.
Japan. Saijo Hideki was a big hit in 1970-1980. In Korea, a group called HOT was very popular. Each generation, there were people who become idols. And those idols had influenced many people, and idols still influence even more people today. And how do these idols affect us? They give us common interests with their friends. When I transferred to school, I didn't have any friends. But by having common interests, I was able to make friends and deepen relationships by sharing common interests and make, make a lot of good memories. Going to Idol's concert to help us release stress, release stress. Yeah. Going to Idol's concert can help us release stress. When the summer vacation started, I went to the concert and released all my stress by shouting and screaming. They encouraged me. Listening to their music encouraged and helped me forget sadness. Watching their videos can also make me laugh even if I'm sad. And they make me do things I wouldn't do. Now, I'm in love with a guy named Jumpin, who is one of the members of BTS, which is my favorite band. I start my morning with him and end my day with him. He is so handsome. But he has a high standard ideal type. Now, I have bad fashion sense. I can't cook well nor sing well. I'm not even fit or smart. As a conclusion, I'm totally opposite from his ideal type. I knew it was impossible, but I wanted to date him so bad. So I decided to do my best to be his ideal type. I started to cook, work out, study hard, buy more clothes, put makeup on every day. I even try to change my personality. What I want to say is, I don't make you do things you wouldn't do and things you hate to do. But idols are not always good. There must be disadvantages to liking idols. We tend to use too much money. Whenever they release albums or do concerts, I always buy their goods and spend tons of money. Also, when they collaborate with some brands, I tend to buy the collaborated products because I want the same thing they're wearing, they're wearing or they have. Not only a product, but also posters or something always comes along with the product. So even if I don't want the product, I want the something that comes along with the product. So how can I not get tempted to buy it? Although I try to control myself, my friends are all buying it. So I feel pressure to buy the things I don't want. But then, things get worse. Procrastination. When I have a lot of work to do, I just put everything off and do Twitters, Facebook, Instagram, and watch things that are related to idols. And I often end up not finishing my work on time, which affects my grades. We miss what we shouldn't miss. Some people skip school just to go to the concert, which means they prioritize idols and important things. Addiction. When I'm totally into Jungkook, I spend all my time thinking about him, and it becomes a serious addiction. There's even a name for it called Celebrity Worship Syndrome. When a person is obsessed with idol, the idol becomes a sinner in their life, and it impacts their life in negative ways. A lot of people are into celebrities, and I am one of them. It's okay to like them. But when we focus too much on celebrities, we miss, there must be something we miss, and we don't even know what we missed. It could be your friends, your family, something really important, or something that affects your life. So do not spend all your time for celebrities. Instead, try taking an interest in various things. I'm a fan of an idol, so it's sad to say this, but honestly, Celebrities don't really care about their friends or their life, and they don't even know we exist in this world. I'm not saying don't like them because they're made in ignorant. What I want to say is balance it out. Your family, friends, schoolwork, rest, exercise, sleep, and then idols. Do your work and care about the people around you. Do not 
make idols your first priority because your life is much more important than those idols. Thank you. We're going to be talking about a fruit vegetable. A fruit vegetable which has an identity so interesting that has. I'm sorry, did I put it again? Which. Thank you, sorry. Okay. Today we're going to talk about a fruit vegetable. A species so interesting that its identity has been debated over and over again, and a species so fascinating that it's even been to court. And by court, I mean the U.S. Supreme Court of Law. So let's begin with that. In the U.S., just over 200 years ago, fruits had lower import taxes than vegetables, so the importers of this plant wanted to label it a fruit so they could get more profit for themselves. But on the other hand, the tax collectors demanded it be recognized as a vegetable so they could collect more taxes, therefore make more money. At one point, the debate got so heated that the common usage classified this plant as a vegetable under the Tariff Act of 1883. This plant I've been referring to is the Solanum lycopersicum. Solanum lycopersicum plants are round, can vary in size, have edible seeds, and are red. If that wasn't enough information to get you guessing, Solanum lycopersicum plants are tomatoes, or tomatoes, if you will. Not only are tomatoes nutritionally and culturally significant, but with, today, with today's globalization, it is, inevitable, it, it is inevitable to come across a tomato in one shape or the other. According to the USDA, American eat, Americans eat around 10 kilograms of tomatoes each year per person, and around half of that comes in other forms such as ketchup, salsa, or tomato sauce, but I mean, what are french fries without ketchup, and what's Italian food without their pomodoro sauce? This multi-purpose vegetable is also known and used internationally for its umami. Umami is a word adopted from the Japanese that can be translated to mean a, sa a savory, pleasant taste, with the savory taste being the fifth basic taste after salty, sweet, bitter, and sour. Umami can be found naturally in some foods, in the glutamate of some foods, such as tomatoes, or, be, or can be exposed by fermenting in the case of cheese, or releasing its amino acids through cooking in the case of beef. When these umami-flavored foods are combined, take, for example, a cheeseburger or bolognese pasta, a combination of tomatoes, cheese, and beef, people's cheeks begin to flush, and they eventually end up looking like tomatoes themselves. Um, I've also observed that
that millennials have been going through a healthy diet and superfood phase, but what they fail to recognize is that tomatoes are nutrient-dense superfoods themselves. With the tomato's natural concentrations of vitamins A, B6, C, E, K, potassium, phosphorus, and more, benefits automatically include softer hairs, like better nails, better eyesight, smaller risks of diabetes, and even a, de a decreased percentage of skin cancer development. A study by the Ohio State University, led by Tatiana Ovenson, a pathology professor, and Jessica Cooperstone, a food scientist, it, um, they showed that skin cancer was decreased in mice by 50% with a diet rich in tomatoes. Consum they showed that consuming tomatoes reduces sunburn by supplying us with dietary carotenoids, the pigments that make tomatoes red, and that is thought to be responsible for its protective effect against UV light damage. And this is relevant because even although the U.S. associates the skin cancer, keratinal carcinoma, with a low mortality rate, they, they still spend $8.1 billion on treatment each year. And I'm standing here telling you about the greatness of tomatoes, but if you could travel back in time and go back to Peru where, the, where its Aztec name meant plump thing with a navel, they would send me away. Colonial American gardeners, originally those from Peru, from the Andes, today, today known as Peru, grew tomatoes for their looks, but were too afraid to eat them because nightshade plants, such as potatoes, tobacco, and our beloved chili peppers, were thought to be poisonous. This is because A, it wasn't mentioned in the Bible, and two, they grew underground closer to Satan. However, as their speculations faded and love for tomatoes grew, people began to call it the apple of love, and the Spanish dedicated a whole festival to it. La Tomatina, the annual festival of tomatoes, is the largest food bite in the world. Though it has no political or religious significance, around 40,000 people gather in a small town in Spain called Buño each year to have some fun with 55 tons of tomatoes. With the price of only 750 euros, you get to start what looks like a bloodbath of tomatoes. At 10 a.m. sharp, people begin climbing a grease pole with a chunk of ham at the top. And when that chunk of ham is, is successfully dropped, the food fight begins. The youngsters of Buño enter the square with trucks full of tomatoes and begin throwing around. At 11 a.m., the, the, the red streets, along with anyone that wants to be washed with them, are washed down with the five trucks hoses. Tomatoes have only been known to uh, tomatoes have only been cultivated for 200 years, yet have grown to have such an interesting history and impact on our cultures. La Tomatina celebrates how tomatoes are superfoods, literally, and how they provide us with endless benefits and taste, umami. I mean, how much better can it get? And with that, I hope to see you all next year on August 29th in Buñol the, on the last Wednesday of August.
Seagull Professionals after defeating the Go World Champion by a victory of 4 to 1. Go is an ancient strategy that was needed in China. The victory of AlphaGo was a historic moment in the development of AI, indicating that it has possibly reached the point of becoming more intelligent than a human brain. Today, I would like to address the potential impact that AI has already had on and is going to have on the dog market around the world. AI is a short term for artificial intelligence. It is a highly complex technology that allows computers to function like the human brain. According to John McCarthy from the Computer Science Department of Stanford University, AI is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. Intelligent machines and computer programs are now found all around us. Common examples which we see in our everyday lives include video games, the iPhone app Siri, or self-checkout machines when we visit the supermarkets. AI has been showing a rapid development over time. In 2004, two prominent U.S. economists, Frank Levery and Richard J. Murney, wrote a book called New Division of Labor. In this book, it was said that self-driven automatic cars will never be successfully produced. However, six years later, in 2010, Google proved that it could make fully automatic cars, contradicting the statement of the economists while threatening the livelihoods of millions of truck and taxi drivers. The development of AI has both benefits and drawbacks. An example of a benefit is that as AI can produce an emotionless workforce, the cost of team building exercise can be reduced. Also, AI does not need to take breaks, holidays, or receive payments, meaning a huge cost savings for businesses. AI robots will also reduce the cases of injuries by replacing human workers for AI robots for dangerous tasks. The development of AI will also create new jobs. Computer programmer is an example of a job that was created due to the development of AI. When computers didn't exist, obviously there was no need for computer programmers. However, now, computer programming is considered to be a very important skill to have, that in all Japanese elementary schools, students will be required to take a computer programming class, starting from 2020. The development of AI also has drawbacks. Professor Obzorn from Science Education Department of Stanford University warns that some jobs will be taken away by the development of AI. These job, jobs that are at high risk of AI takeover are those that are repetitive, routine, and predictable. For example, cashiers, telephone marketers, or fast food cooks. These jobs are low skilled and are fulfilled by those with limited qualifications. Therefore, will be potentially removing the employment opportunities from the poorest in society. However, not all jobs are in danger of the rise in AI technology. According to an article from Investopedia, an American website which focuses on investing education in financial news, it is said that jobs that cannot be automatized are those that include teachers, lawyers, counselors, and doctors. These jobs cannot be replaced by AI as it requires a level of adaptability and creativity that only human can provide. The development of AI has both benefits and drawbacks. As AI develops in rapid speed, it is important for us to be aware of the effect it has on us. As students, we should be aware of how the development of AI affects the job market around the world before we choose our major at college. And as adults, you should be aware of whether or not your job is in danger of AI takeover. I hope that now you are more aware of the potential impact that AI could cause on you and your career.
Many of you have picked one up, shuffled the sides around, lined up two green squares, maybe even a row of three. Many of you have wondered how to do it, how to solve it, how many moves it would take, how many possible configurations this little puzzle offers. But few of you have figured it out. It's hard to do. There are 43 quintillion possible configurations of the cube. That is the number 43 followed by 18 zeros. To put that into perspective, if you had a Rubik's cube for every one of those possible configurations and lined them up side by side, they would cover the surface area of the Earth and tower 273 cubes high. The Rubik's cube was originally created by Hungarian architecture professor Arno Rubik in 1974. His goal was to create a working model to help explain three-dimensional geometry. He did it so well, in fact, that he himself had trouble wrapping his mind around his own invention. It took Dr. Rubik well over a month to complete the first Rubik's Cube. But since that mo first moment of pride and satisfaction in the mid-1970s, millions have lined up to take on the challenge. The Rubik's Cube is the most successful toy of all time, selling over 350 million units. By the mid-80s, it was a smashing success worldwide. One out of every five people on the planet had played with the Rubik's Cube. The book, You Can Do the Cube, written by a 12-year-old boy from the UK, Patrick Bossert, was published in 1981 and sold over 1.5 million copies. The book offered simple step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve the cube. Today, most cubers turn straight to YouTube for a tutorial. The Rubik's Cube is made up of 26 miniature cubes. These miniature cubes are a combination of one-faced in the middle, consisting of one color, two-faced on the sides, consisting of two colors, and three-faced on the corners, consisting of three colors. Understanding this concept of miniature cube types is the first major step towards solving the cube. There are two main methods to solving the cube, the beginner's method and the advanced method. In the beginner's method, you apply a series of algorithms while working through the layers of the cube. This is the, this, I'm going to demonstrate this today. When solving the cube, you first complete one face, usually the color white. Mastering the color scheme of your cube is next. When starting with the color white on the bottom, authentic cubes go green, red, blue, orange, and yellow on top. After completing the first white face correctly, you should have also completed the first layer of the cube. With your first algorithm, you then complete the second layer of the cube. Following this, you create a yellow cross on the top of your square. Orienting the middle pieces so that they match their corresponding color face is next. Finally, you apply a series of moves to complete the cube. In this demonstration, I have used a classic 3x3 cube. Other sizes have made it onto the market, including a 4x4, 5x5, and so on, all the way up to 17x17, which takes around two and a half hours to solve but none have been as trendy as the classic 3x3 three three cube. Its popularity is marked not only in sales and profits, but also by TV show and movie appearances, most notably as a prop in many scenes of the Big Bang Theory and as a critical plot point in the taxi scene of Will Smith's The Pursuit of Happiness. Now that you have learned more than you wanted to about the Rubik's Cube, keep your eye out for its next appearance in your life.
my name is Prachi, and today I'll be talking about happiness. Did you ever think about why happiness is important? According to my research, happiness is something everyone is able to achieve every time. However, I hope by listening to my speech, some people who, are, who might feel better if they're sad or depressed or feel motivated to try something new in their life. Happiness is a state of being well. Here, being well means that state in which the positive mental faculties of an individual are dominant over the negative ones. Happiness in this context encompasses the whole body, mind, and soul of an individual. Although this state of being happiness, happy is to a large extent being controlled by the mind of that particular individual. In this way, happiness is a state of mind. As happiness is an abstract concept, so it emerges in a particular individual's mind and it encompasses the whole body. Thus, happiness as a state of ha as a state of mind is, I think, desirable for the entire world, as being nobody in the world wants to remain unhappy. Happy state of mind, therefore, is more valuable than pomp and gaiety in life. The dictum "money as his money does" is certainly overshadowed by happiness. This is because money can bring materialistic gain, and this gain is transitory to a large extent, but happiness in the true sense of the overwhelming is not certainly the only source of happiness in life, as it can sometimes be done by an innocent smile of a kid. Money is not everything that we need in life. So for an individual, happiness is all pervasive in life. Now I'll be discussing some ways and means of achieving happiness. I think the ways and means of achieving happiness cannot be categorized in order type compartments. This is because, as it is rightly said, many a man, many a mind. In this way, many the mind are the many are the means of achieving happiness. Achieving happiness has to do more with likes and dislikes of an individual, as well as his or her his or her whole personality at large. A person may be happy in a routine and punctual life full of his or her responsibilities, whereas another person may be happy by enjoying the serenity of nature and thereby remaining in the laps of nature. Students may be happy when hard work results in success. At the same time, a bookworm may be happy sitting in front of a pile of books, whereas the same person from, whereas a different person from his same family can feel happy when he wins in sports. In the same way, a person's transition from a disillusioned mental condition to the state of mental calmness is also a way of achieving happiness. In the same way, a patient's journey from sickness to well-being is a source of happiness. On the contrary, it would be a story of one man's pain and one man's pleasure. Considering all things, it can be said that happiness is an abstract concept. Its ways and means of achieving happiness are varied. So are the varied of so are the varied individual mind in the world. So is the first sight of light for a blind person after his eye surgery, and by which surgery he gains his first vision, becomes the greatest reason for his life for achieving happiness. Sometimes, ways of achieving happiness are situational. For example, the the first sight of water is a great source of happiness for a thirsty person, whereas a balloon shrinking of water level or disappearance of water is the greatest source of happiness. In the same way, for a drowning person, a sight of helping person or a log of wood nearby to hold upon himself, to hold upon in order to save himself from drowning is the greatest source of happiness. Similarly, for a poor person, being able to meet his daily needs, certainly by fair means, is the greatest source of happiness. All in all, the ways and means of achieving happiness depends on the nature, personality, and the type of work with a particular individual engaged in his life. In analyzing happiness and the ways and means of achieving happiness, it is worthwhile pondering whether the things 
which has made us happy and this is at the same time derogatory for others. If it is so, it will not be true for the happy person. Thank you. will permit to listen to the baggy the spin films of this do not use your phones
function as a new skin without any danger of rejection. Even though organ transplant may have become much easier, the problem was that any genetic issues would be duplicated when cloned. So for example, if someone has a genetic heart disease, then cloning the organ would also clone the problem. So basically, potentially it would not be an effective treatment option. The third and last letter in my acronym is W, which stands for Women Conceiving. Conceiving. Women and those unable to have children will have the alternative to conception. When one or both partners has a rare genetic disease, that rare genetic, uh, when one or both partners has a rare genetic disease, then that rare genetic trait will have disastrous, even fatal effect if the child were conceived naturally. But cloning could be the answer. If a child used a human cloning, then the genetic strand could be, could be altered to prevent this rare genetic disease. And if the parents were for any reason infertile, they could use human cloning to avoid this kind of genetic disease. Unfortunately, the vast majority of pregnancies so far have, been, have gone very badly. In most of them, the clones have died, and in almost all of them, the lives of the mother and clones have been put at risk. This is why many scientists predict that the, predict that the cost of human suffering and failures will be large. Dolly the sheep was one success in 272 trials. According to a Guardian article, human cloning global debate about human cloning. There are many ethical concerns about human cloning and its benefits. The three key points that I introduced in this speech are COW, C-O-W. C standing for cures of genetic diseases, O standing for organ transplants, and W standing for women conceiving. And the, cloning, uh, the discussion of human cloning is going to intensify in the coming years. I hope that you will now be a better informed person in order to participate in this global debate. Uncontrollably, please call the ambulance. No, please call the ambulance and tell them that I'm suffering from glossophobia. Glossophobia, which is the fear of public speaking. <laughs> so, why am I here, you ask? Well, my doctor recommended me to take speech classes and to work up to a public performance as a way of conquering my phobia. It is known as behavioral therapy and it is one of the most common treatments for phobias. But what exactly are phobias, and where did the term originate? Let's try a little test. In this box, I have my pink tarantula. You know, <laughs> one of those hairy, big-eyed, gigantic spiders. You, madam, may I open this box and place a spider on your lap? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> now, the question we must ask. Is this reluctance enough to label this lady as suffering from arachnophobia? Or not? Well, the answer depends on whether her fear gives rise to some level of impairment. What that would mean is that she would deliberately avoid going out at night or into dark, attic 
blank spaces because she couldn't see where any spiders were. Her fear would alter her behavior. The person begins organizing their life around avoiding the object of her fear as she has an overpowering need to steer clear of anything which triggers her anxiety. Phobia sufferers have an anxiety disorder which exists even when the danger is not present or is immediate. By the way, the box is empty. <laughs> <laughs> the term phobia actually originated from mythology. Phobos was the son of Ares, the Greek god of war. The story goes that Phobos was a formidable and frightening fighter, so much so that warriors would paint his face on their shields to give their enemies a real fright. This story has given rise to the term phobia. However, the word phobia wasn't actually used until a Roman doctor named Celsus coined its use when he was confronted with a patient suffering from an advanced case of rabies. One of the symptoms of this disease is the inability to drink water due to a failure in the swallowing mechanism. And the doctor misinterpreted this as an actual fear of water. He described the patient as suffering from hydrophobia, literally water fear. Although he had misdiagnosed the situation, the term phobia was to become an accepted medical term in 1947 when it was enlisted on the international classification of diseases. While many modern psychoanalysts believe that psychological problems such as phobias can be caused by conflicts in the mind, usually conflicts that the person is not even aware that they're having. Commonly, this is caused by a clash of fears and desires that were too uncomfortable for the person to let themselves be consciously aware of. So, the feelings would go underground and emerge as an apparently random fear. For example, someone may develop a fear of bald men while visiting an aquarium. It's strange, huh? <laughs> Some of these phobias, just like the fear of bald men, are hard not to laugh at, as they seem so removed from a person's normal reality. Spiders, snakes, Sharks, I think we can all understand. Similarly, fear of height and darkness are also easy to grasp. But what about this? I hope there aren't any peanut butter lovers here. Arachibutyrophobia. The fear of having peanut butter stuck to the roof of your mouth. <laughs> now, after hearing about these strange phobias, you may wonder if you're born with it or you developed it. Well, the answer isn't black or white. Perhaps some of you may join the group known as chlorophobics, those who fear clowns, after you watch the adaptation of Stephen King's It. Whereas others of you may be totally unaffected. I know I had a completely different view swimming the ocean after I watched the movie Jaws. <laughs> Mind you, I can still go for a swim in this week. So, in answer to the question, phobias can be inherent or developed due to trauma. So if by any chance you're currently developing a fear of listening to dreadful public speaking, <laughs> the good news is that some phobias are curable. Patients can get psychotherapy, such as counseling, and learn to constantly remind themselves that they have no such fear. Other patients can get medication, such as antidepressants or tranquilizers, to cope with the chemical imbalance in their minds, which manifests itself as a phobia. Lastly, Patients can get behavioral therapy, where they find ways to confront their fear in real life, just as I'm doing with this speech. Oh, my hands are shaking. Dry as a bone. <laughs> Time to call my doctor and tell him that the therapy was success. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
together, it lightens the darkness. Do you know anything about renewable, non-renewable, and nuclear energy? First, there are types of renewable energy. Solar, hydropower, wave, geothermal, wind, and fuel cell. So, and I will talk about four of them. But before I talk about it, I'll tell you about generator. It is a machine that spins, and, and they have turbines and magnets. When it spins, the magnets rub each other and makes energy. Now let's go on. Solar energy. You use solar panels, like the ones that we have in our science building. <coughs> they get the sunlight from the sun. Then they make it into steam. The steam goes through a tube and then spins the turbine. Hydropower uses water flow, for example, dams. In dams, there are giant tubes, and inside it, there are giant and huge generators. And when the water comes out, because of the water flow, they spin. Next is wind power. Wind power is, is similar to hydro, but they use the wind flow, and then they spin the turbine. But next one is unusual. Not many people know about this one. Fuel cell. Fuel cell is a machine that uses oxygen and hydrogen. And then it makes electricity. But not only electricity, it makes fresh water. It might be very useful for the future. Now let's go on. This is how we do energy. Well, to use non-renewable energy, you have to have fuel cells. There are three types. Petroleum, gas, coal. When you burn them, they turn into carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases. Many people worry that it might turn gone. And you can't use non-renewable energy anymore. Many future generation kids wouldn't be able to know about non-renewable energy. Then it is nuclear energy. The nuclear you use atoms. When atoms touches each other, they explode and makes heat. Then the heat evaporates water nearby and then makes it into steam. Then the steam spins tur the turbine of a generator. Nuclear is but dangerous. When it is very radioactive. Radioactivity can bre break down and attack DNA. And every year, 30,000 people die. A radio, a pregnant woman who may have radioactive, may have a unusual looking kid. Now that I've informed you, it is your duty to use energy wisely. Thank you.
for you that will affect the outcome of your future and perhaps the future of many, many others. Most of the times, the people making these decisions are our parents. When we think of our parents, we usually imagine caring and loving homemakers who have our best at heart. But sometimes I wonder, do they always make the best decisions for us? One important decision, or perhaps the most important after healthcare, are the, are the decisions they make regarding their child's education. Should little Johnny go to preschool, or which kindergarten is best suited to develop his artistic skills? St. Mary's, ASIJ, or St. Moore? Today I would like to inform you about the facts of an alternative form of education, which 3% of American families have opted for. Homeschooling, the education of their children inside the home. In Europe, public education started with the Reformation around 1524, and this was home-based. This continued to be the norm until the 1830s, when formal classroom education became the most common. Then, in the 1960s, John Rush Jr. pushed for home education to combat the non-religious public school system of the United States. There have been many studies since which would seem to point to the fact that homeschooling is the natural environment for learning with the involvement of all the families. Why do so many parents do this? I have found two main motivations. Firstly, the dissatisfaction with the local schools available. And secondly, the wish to be more involved with their child's development. There is also the wish that they would like a specific religious or moral position to be taught to their children. So, what are some of the pros and cons, fors and against, of homeschooling? Parents feel they should be able to choose the learning method and content of their child's education. With homeschooling, the method of teaching can be customized to his or her learning level, style, and interest. Resources are freely available from public libraries, bookstores, the internet, and the World Wide Web. About 78% of homeschoolers in the United States are also users of public libraries. The reasons I have found for parents choosing this method of education for their children are because either the child has physical or mental issues, other special needs, religious or moral reasons, and concerns and dissatisfactions with the schools available. On average, homeschoolers score 37 percentile points above public schoolers, and high school-aged homeschoolers had a GPA of 3.74, higher than their counterparts. About 17 percent of such children go on to higher education. On the other hand, critics of homeschooling question the socialization skills of such children. A study by John Taylor has shown that only 10.3% of such children had high self-confidence in themselves, compared to 50% from conventional schools. The National Education Association of the United States are opposed to this form of education, as it tends to indoctrinate the child and creates a situation where the parents regard their child's mind as theirs, wishing to keep them under control. In Germany, homeschooling is illegal and it was ruled by the federal courts of Germany that it was even a form of child abuse. In many other countries, it is considered socially not desirable or acceptable. In Australia, this form of education must be registered and open to inspection at any time. The same is in Israel. In Brazil, it is not even considered a legitimate form of education. I have been able to find statistics from respected research studies which back both sides, the fors and the against. A study by Dorothy Moore has shown that formal classroom education damages the child academically, socially, mentally, and even sometimes physically. A different study has shown that homeschooling creates excessive bonds which may cause the child to have difficulties in adapting to the outer world in the future. Many young actors, athletes, and musicians are homeschooled to accommodate their training and practice schedules. But do we really know the long-term effect on these young people? Perhaps a great musician, but a lonely and isolated personality. Who can tell? 
I have presented to you with only a fraction of the information and research available about homeschooling. But given the information, it is up to you to decide on the merits of this form of schooling. Thank you. started using chloroform for his childbirth patients. In fact, this became so popular in Europe that even the British royals started using it. However, in 1868, a key breakthrough occurred. Edmund Andrews of Chicago proposed that ether be used as a key ingredient to anesthesia, rather than a pure ether. Ether is what gives modern anesthesia its signature kind of slightly sweet smell. Although these methods were archaic, unrefined, and very risky, they still somewhat alleviated the pain of the patients and was definitely better than nothing. However, modern anesthesia is much more versatile and safe than its older counterparts. Generally speaking, anesthesia can be categorized into two, into two groups, regional and general. These terms are quite self-explanatory, with regional anesthesia being used to target, to target specific areas of the body, 
while general anesthesia is used to completely numb, sedate, or otherwise knock out the patient. Usually, regional anesthesia is applied using a needle or a syringe, and general anesthesia is inhaled as a vapor through a vaporizer connected to a mask. Although some people believe that general anesthesia is used to perform more major operations, this is actually untrue. For example, doctors will often choose regional anesthesia to perform risky operations on the heart, brain, stomach, intestines, and urinary tracts. This is especially important so the doctor knows that the patient is conscious. This is especially true for brain operations where one swipe could sever a sensitive nerve. All in all, regional anesthesia is seen as the more versatile type of anesthesia in the medical community. However, general anesthesia does offer some advantages as well. General anesthesia is the safer option when the procedure is long, the patient's breathing is compromised, or when there is significant blood loss to be expected. Doctors will often use general anesthesia to ensure the patient's comfort if the patient chooses to do so. I think it's amazing that we've evolved this medicine from a crude pro mixture to something that has less than one in a hundred failure rate. In the operating room, anesthesia is what makes the whole procedure possible. It is what makes things so much easier for doctors and patients alike. So next time you go under the knife, I hope you appreciate all the time and effort that's been put into making you comfortable. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Those are still here. This marks the end of the poetry speaking. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.